so once again, we have a situation where a parody basically becomes reality. I found this picture on Facebook and I thought it was very compelling and it reminded me of the video that I'm getting ready to share with you. So I figured I'd include it as part of the introduction. Of course you're allowed to ask questions. Here is the list of approved questions. You're absolutely free to study and investigate for yourself. Here is the list of approved sources. We're not trying to stifle thought. We want you to learn everything you can as you reach the approved conclusions. This probably made you chuckle because it is kind of funny. But by the time you get finished watching this video, much like the other parodies that I've shared that are no longer parodies in the past, I think you'll come to the same conclusion that I did, that this isn't funny anymore, because it's not a parody. It's the truth. So what I'm about to show you is a video that was leaked. It was not meant for public consumption. It was part of a critical race theory and anti-racism presentation at a college in Oklahoma. And in it, um, like the whole thing I think was about an hour long. I'm not gonna go over all of it because I don't think all of it was necessarily as relevant, but I will provide a link to a full version of it in the description. Um, I think what you're about to see, well, you'll find rather disturbing. And it tells a story that is very different than the ones that were being told as far as to what this is all about. As we go forward, I want you to consider for the fact, uh, basically consider the fact that what is determined to be racist, what is determined to be hate speech, and what is determined to be white supremacist are all concepts that just seem to be amorphous and can be rewritten at any moment. When you listen to these people talk about this, you would think that maybe they were encountering, you know, kids in their college classes who were like literally KKK members or, you know, Nazi skinheads who were, you know, given the Zieg Heil, you know, Hitler salute in the middle of the classroom. I suspect that has never happened to any of them. Um, I would suspect that the likelihood is, is that when they discuss things like overt racism in the classroom, they're talking about some of the vague concepts that were on that white supremacy um, pyramid that I shared in my conversation with Mr. Rossi. One of the things you're going to notice about this video is that all of the professors giving the presentations look very young. Um, you know, if you've ever worked somewhere, for example, where you may have to sell alcohol or tobacco, I, I have, and I'm thinking to myself as I'm listening to these people lecture, that I probably would have carded everybody that was giving these presentations. And it's not to say that young people can't be educators, they absolutely can. But as was pointed out by Paul Rossi in my interview that I just did with him, he noticed that one of the trends was that the majority of the teachers and staff that he was dealing with at his high school were all very young. And the reason that's more relevant is it means that they've come out of this generation that has been you know, fully indoctrinated into these concepts of CRT and anti-racism. So without further ado, let's get into the video. So coupled with that, right, is this idea of setting an anti-racist tone in our classes. So we have to clarify boundaries. And at this point, especially if you've taught 12, 13, um, students are a little bit more emboldened to be racist, like overtly racist in 12, 13. Um, and either in their writing or in the conversations that they have in class, right, on discussion boards, in person, whatever. Um, I've experienced all of it. So over the time, it's like, okay, I need to like set these boundaries, but also I need to work to make sure that like one of the fears is that we're going to get in trouble for this, right? Like we can't tell students that they can't say something in class, um, but we can. And let me tell you how, right? So the first day of class, I have a a slideshow like prepared and everything talking about like the overview of the course what they can expect and then we talk about like the expectations in their behavior in class and in their writing and i include these these two statements in each of these right they have to avoid derogatory remarks critiques and hate speech if they use any of those things if any of those things come through in their writing or in their comments i will call them out on it 
and I tell them, I call you out on this. We're going to have this conversation if this takes place in class or in your writing. And I tell them to avoid white supremacist ideas or sources when they are making their own arguments. If they're working to try to persuade a white supremacist to not be a white supremacist, right? To persuade someone against racism, then they have to look at those sources, but they're working to dismantle that. And that's completely different than employing those things and their own ideas. And I explicitly tell them they cannot use white supremacist ideas or sources in their work. They can't use those in any conversations that they have. They will, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it if it happens, if it continues to happen, report them for violating the student code of conduct, right? So You're not allowed to use any terminology that we have determined to be white supremacist or racist or whatever. Um, and if you continue to do so, we will report you for violating the student code of conduct. Now, remember what I just said before we started this clip, that the definitions of what is white supremacist, what is racist, what, you know, th these are amorphous definitions that they are willing to change on a moment's notice. And they're essentially saying, you know, before you even begin your quote unquote education, that you will not be allowed to use any of these terms that we do not agree with. You will not be allowed to make arguments that we do not agree with, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, there's no way this could possibly go wrong, right? So something that we read at the beginning of the semester to kind of frame this conversation as well is when free speech becomes unfree speech by Ibram Kendi. And it's just a two page article. It's super short. It's accessible, right? So I want to take a brief segue to identifying who Ibram X. Kendi is and reading his article, but also to give you an idea of the kind of person we're talking about. Ibram X. Kendi is the author of the book, how to be an anti-racist and in recently more infamously, was seen at a uh, lecture and he was asked during the Q&A to define racism. And he used the word racism and racist, I think like six or seven times in his own definition of what racism is. This is what is known as a circular definition. It's something like, it's a fallacy that I learned about, I wanna say in like the first grade, that you cannot use the word that you are providing the definition of in your definition. Anyway, um, he's also a guy who got paid $20,000 for a 45 minute zoom call, you know, to a school basically to teach them how to be anti-racist. Anyway, his article that she was talking about is called when free speech becomes unfree speech. This was written in October 20th, 2015. And if you just listen to my, uh, conversation with Paul Rossi, he pointed out that 2015 was kind of when all of this anti-racist and CRT stuff in schools really started to get, you know, underway. Anyway, <clears throat> when free speech becomes unfree speech by Ibram X. Kendi, I read the headlines. I formed my opinion. I plan to board the bandwagon urging student activists to stop censoring student newspapers for printing racist columns. Over the last month or so, journalists, professors, and administrators have been ridiculing these student activists at Wesleyan University and now Brown University as overly sensitive, emotional, ill-equipped to debating, and the ultimate heresy of all, anti-free speech. On September 14th, Brian St um, Staskavage maintained in the Wesleyan Argus that the Black Lives Matter movement is not legitimate or at the very least hypocritical. Stas um, Staskavage's column sparked an outrage among anti-racists at Wesleyan University who called for a boycott of the newspaper until it effectively diversified its staff and content. These protests fired the engines of the reactionary bandwagon, which shifted the discourse of critique from Staskavage and the Argus to those activists reportedly suppressing free speech. <clears throat> a less public but somewhat similar turn of events occurred at Brown University last week when anti-racist students were irate about the two racist columns printed on successive days in the Brown Daily Herald by M. Dizali Mayer. Mayer followed up his biologically racist musings on Monday with his culturally racist musings of, of Europe's cultural superiority in Tuesday's column. Instead of protesting Columbus Day, all Native Americans should celebrate Columbus Day since it honors the history of the old world Europe civilizing the new world. I want to be clear, I definitely don't 
agree with that crap. But <clears throat> anyway, Candy goes on to say, I had no problem with the activists' demands to diversify the staff and content of their student newspapers. But as a staunch defender of free speech and those mediums that bring into the public light those racial debates that regularly occur in private, I had a serious problems with these activists condemning the newspapers for printing these racist columns. But as my eyes traveled from the headlines to the news stories and from the news stories to the activist position papers, I changed my viewpoint. I came across an open letter to the Wesleyan community from a group of concerned and unapologetic students of color. This was the name of the paper issued in late September, quote, freedom of speech in its popular understanding, end quote. The group penned does not protect Black Lives Matter advocates who are trying to survive in a racist world, but instead protects the belief systems of, dom of the dominant people, despite the extent of their heightened ignorance, end quote. Indeed, these students were correct, not just about free speech, but about notions of American freedom. No one can deny that some Americans have used the freedoms of the, Bill and of the Bill of Rights to substantiate their efforts to take away the freedoms of others. Generations of American slaveholders defended their freedom to enslave. All year long, advocates of gun, gun control and marriage equality have heard the cacophony of freedom to bear arms and freedom of religion. I had to admit that my fellow free speech defenders were somewhat similar to those National Rifle Association members and those homophobic Christian discriminators. It's interesting that he puts it that way because I've used the example of Christian discriminators when I'm describing what people, basically the way people behave when they're involved in the woke inquisition, you know, that they want, you know, things that they don't, uh, they find objectionable, uh, censored. Anyway, I thought I was defending the free speech of those column writers and newspaper editors when in fact I was merely defending unfree speech. Just like we should not have the freedom to enslave people, we should not have the freedom to publish untruths about people. When the press publishes false or unproven racist ideas in news stories or columns without informing readers, there is no truth to those claims and tales. That is not an exercise in free speech. That is unfree speech. For example, Stas um, Staskovich's column in the Wesleyan Argus was based on the false idea that the Black Lives Matter movement was increasing violence towards police. That's not a false idea, but okay. Neither Staskovich nor the editors provided the data that show that police shootings are down this year. It was almost as ridiculous as this unproven claim that, quote, there are only a few bad apples on police for forces. Again, the data shows says otherwise. This is a lie, but okay. Anyway, circulating racist falsehoods without warning have long been the occupation of unfree racial speech, constraining constructive thought, lies and sli lies enslave the mind and harm human life. As the Wesleyan activist stated, by focusing on the freedom of speech instead of students' lives and ability to safely exist on this campus, you are practicing censorship and you are partaking in racism. To change this, to provide safety for all of our students' lives, we do not have to necessarily prohibit any and every racist column, just as the companies can sell harmful, harmful products as long as they clearly label them to consumers so too should periodicals have the freedom to publish any sp spuriously racist ideas as long as they clearly label them to readers as untrue. But that would require strenuous fact-checking on the part of the editors, and it is much easier for editors to not fact-check quotes and columns, and then print these racist quotes and columns laced with falsehoods or unsubstantiated claims, and then use free speech to defend themselves from, outraged and, from the outraged and offended. So he's basically trying to create a new, like a new form of free speech that does not include anything that he doesn't agree with or anything that his movement does not agree with. And he listed things that I can actually prove, you know, via like actual studies, you know, as untrue. Like he said that these things were not true and they are true. Um, and <laughs> so if, if this is the concept behind like, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to redefine what free speech is by just simply saying, well, no, 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 that's not free speech. That's unfree speech because it doesn't agree with me you know, you're creating a situation that's going to be abused. I guarantee it. You know, um, but anyway, let me continue. We should have the freedom to offer in the press varying controversial and provocative racial thoughts from the ground of evidentiary truth, 
that's free speech. At the same time, we must recognize and take seriously the difference between unfree speech based on falsehoods and free speech based on facts, while never conflating the two. Free speech, in its open-minded search for truth, produces lively debates, growing intelligence, and mutual love. Unfree speech, in its closed-minded defense of falsehoods, produces arguments, ignorance, and hate. This is literally exactly what the majority of the racial activists that are currently, you know, basically engaged in quote-unquote activism are doing. Closed-minded defense of falsehoods that produce arguments, ignorance, and hate. Like, that's exactly what they're doing. This is a complete projection. Anyway, he says, We should applaud the students at Wesleyan and Brown who are trying to silence unfree speech in their student newspapers. If anywhere in America should be the unpolluted haven of free speech, where circulating racist falsehoods are barred from public mediums, where thinkers are speaking and debating all sorts of social issues from the platforms of evidence, then it should be our colleges and universities. After all, if academia is not our society's cradle of debates from truth, then what is it? So the problem with him suggesting this, I mean, like, if it really was about truth, I would be totally behind it. The thing is, is that they want a different truth. <laughs> and as I've been, dis basically, as I've been demonstrating in multiple videos that I've done so far, the anti-racist and CRT movements literally want to eliminate rational thinking. They want to eliminate the scientific method. They want us to value the experiences of color of people of color as long as they're the people of color that agree with them that is as evidence like without any like you you can't in any way contradict that you can't challenge it you can't ask for any kind of evidence if a person of color said this happened then you're just supposed to go along with it once again the caveat being it has to be a person of color who comes from their accepted mindsets you know not somebody who's afflicted with the parasitic condition of whiteness. So anyway, <clears throat> this is what she is reading to her students, or rather having them read before she'll let them participate in her class. And it basically just suggests, well, it's not free speech if it doesn't agree with me. And the premise of the this article is that there's no such thing as free speech. Somebody is paying for what's, what, what we say, right? So when we make racist comments, when we make hate speech, when we're engaging in white supremacist ideologies, somebody is paying for that emotionally, physically, however, right? And so it's not really free speech. Right? What's funny is, is that's actually not what Ibram X. Kendi suggested. Um, she is like kind of, I guess, conflating the concept of free as in it has a price or a cost. Free speech is about I have the freedom to say as I, you know, to, and speak as I see fit. They're not the same thing. I mean, I understand kind of the, the curve she's trying to throw there to suggest that there's a cost for people being able to say things, you know, but that's not what Ibram X. Kendi was suggesting, and it's logically fallacious. Right. And in the classroom, free speech does not apply. The Supreme Court has actually upheld that hate speech, derogatory speech, any of the isms do not apply in the classroom because they do not foster a productive learning environment. And so as instructors, we can tell our students, no, you do not have the right to say that. Stop talking right now, right? We can call them out on that. And another way I kind of frame this to kind of set the, set the tone here, right, is I use the James Baldwin quote, we can disagree and still love each other. We're not going to agree on everything, right? If we did, there, there, we wouldn't have any issues. We'd be in a utopia, right? But if the disagreement is rooted in the oppression and denial of humanity and someone's right to exist, that is not permitted, right? We cannot deny someone their basic human rights. We cannot deny someone human dignity. We cannot question someone's very existence. That is not conductive. That's not productive. It is not allowed in my classroom. And when we frame it this way, students would have to like, if they wanted to push back against that, what's their response? Oh no, I want to deny someone's human like humanity like who's gonna say that right and 
This idea of denying somebody's humanity is actually a fairly common fallacious straw man um, that I hear all the time. Like, especially if you're talking about, say, things like trans rights, you know, you're denying my right to exist or something to that effect because you don't you don't want me to participate in female sports, despite the fact that I still have um, biologically male advantages. You know, you're denying my right to exist or whatever. I've literally, you know, so the real reason that nobody would ever want to say that is because nobody really thinks that, with the exception of actual, blatant, real racists, which make up a very tiny minority. Um, you know, but you know, it's kind of chilling to listen to her just say, free speech does not apply in the classroom, you know, and to try to quote the Supreme Court to suggest that that's the case. And, you know, and you are not allowed to say that. Stop talking right now. Like, can you imagine being told that, you know, <laughs> in an education situation? If they do, I mean, that's a whole other world of issues, but I think framing it this way has really helped my students see this. And I haven't had an issue this semester, right? I've had two students who have been talking about their stakeholders and their stakeholders make these kinds of claims. They've had an issue clarifying that it's their stakeholder making these claims. But it's like, hey, like we need to talk about this, right? You need to make sure that you identify this as your stakeholder's view and let's kind of work through how this works with the issue. But none of my students have pushed back against it, against any of this this semester. And none of them have been openly racist. None of them have even been like covertly racist this semester, which is refreshing and, and odd. It's interesting that she says that it's odd that none of her students were overtly racist. But I have a theory as to probably why it happened is that, rather didn't happen, is that there really actually isn't a whole lot of overtly racist people on her campus in the first place. But what I want to really focus on about the kind of entertaining this um, racist argument is I think that there is... Um, Sometimes when we come into unit two, which is based on rhetorical listening, there's a misunderstanding that it's rooted in radical hospitality, which is every opinion matters. And if someone has a differing point of view, you ought to sit down and listen to it. But that is not what unit two is about. And this is where you have to take into account that you're not talking to a monolith. Our students are not one kind of student. And I think a lot of times we see this uh, unit as an opportunity to get our students who have been closed off to marginalized voices or marginalized experiences to open up and listen and start to think about the stake that other people have in these issues that are theoretical for them but very like physical and real and material um, for others but we also have marginalized students 35 percent of our students in fact are and um you we might have students that come into the classroom and they come in and they strongly believe in um, a specific, say, like um, part of the Black Lives Matter movement. I've had a student actually do this. When we started out unit two, I, I asked, what's something that you're very passionate about that you have a strong opinion on? One of my um, students, um, one of my uh, black students, actually, she said, Black Lives Matter. I said, um, that is not an issue that I would take up. That's not an argument. It's a fact, right? Black Lives Matter. You are not obligated to entertain or listen to an argument that is trying to um, tell you that your real experiences are not real because the person making the argument has never experienced them. So there's a few things about that piece that I want to um, point out. One of which is her suggestion that, you know, actually, no, not all opinions are valid. Um, she brings up a student that talks about Black Lives Matter, which kind of points to the um, word game that Black Lives Matter is in the first place, just like the Patriot Act or anti-fascist. Um, there are plenty of people, you know, that don't agree with what Black Lives Matter, the organization, is doing who still believe that Black Lives Matter. Um, and you're put in a situation where you either just go along with it, otherwise you were, you know, you were suggesting that you therefore believe, don't believe that Black Lives Matter. You know, so for example, um, I believe Black Lives Matter absolutely, along with all other homo sapiens. I do not agree with burning down businesses of innocent people who had nothing to do with your issue. 
I do not believe in violence. I do not believe in threatening people or coercion to try to achieve political gains. But, um, you know, that those are the nuances about the Black Lives Matter issue that are a debate. And she's just basically suggesting that that's not a debate. It's a fact that's already settled. The issue of whether or not black people matter. Yeah, that's settled. Whether or not Black Lives Matter, the organization, you know, is actually going about, you know, you know, improving the lives of people of color, that is actually up to debate. I have a funny feeling, though, that she would never allow such debates to take place in her class. Another frame that you're going to hear quite a bit in here is the suggestion that, um, you know, you don't get to talk about that if you have no stake in it. Like, um, this is that's how this particular teacher actually, you know, tries to defuse a lot of these situations. Like, how does this affect you? And if it doesn't affect you, you just shouldn't talk about it. So I like to come back. Kelly had that great Baldwin quote that we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity. So this is really key and important as we're bringing in that unit two and 1113 in particular, that we are not asking our marginalized students to listen to arguments that come from a cultural logic of white supremacy. And if a student does pick something, it is our job as their instructor to get into the messiness of it and say, let's talk about how, like, maybe you're not obligated to listen to that argument. So this is her saying to her students, if, if they're persons of color, let's talk about how maybe you're not obligated to listen to that argument, as in you can just completely discount it altogether without even considering it. She's going to go on and elaborate on that. Is it of use? Um, is it denying humanity in any way? Um, is the person making the argument, do they have the same stake in the issue as you have it, right? Um, so this is the classic, you know, you can't talk about racism because you're white. You can't talk about sexism because you're male. You know, that's the whole issue of do you have the same stake in it? And it's fallacious to suggest that somebody should not be able to challenge a concept just because it may not directly affect them. Um, you know, certainly somebody who is black, for example, who has encountered racism, you know, would have a different perspective, but that doesn't suddenly give them a license to say things that are just irrational. Um, and that's, I think, at the core of what you know, the problem is here is that they just want to be able to censor anybody who's white, you know, or any black person who's been afflicted with the parasitic condition of whiteness. You know, if, if you don't even have to consider the opinion of somebody who does not fall into this, you know, certain category of person, you know, and you're free to make any argument you want. And if they disagree with you, you don't even have to listen to what they have to say because they're not on the approved list of people who are allowed to disagree with you. Um, so these are really important aspects to think about when you're teaching that. When we're when we're teaching how to listen to differing points of view, it has to come with the caveat that it's not rooted in a white super supremacist argument. And that is what rhetorical listening is all about. Ah, but what's a white supremacist argument? That's the thing that continually changes and is amorphous and seems to have whatever purpose they need it to have in the moment. It's all about um, thinking about how privilege and power are affecting that negotiation. And it's not just um, for our white students to think about how they're in privilege. It's to allow our marginalized students to say, this person is making an argument from a place of privilege. They haven't tried to understand my material reality right now. And so we couldn't even engage in the discussion. They haven't first listened to me or tried to hear where I'm coming from. So at that point, we kind of intervene and we can sway, right? We can it help them find a topic that isn't one that they um, shouldn't take up because it is harmful or it is um, rooted in oppression in some way. So they make this uh, point about your material reality a lot. And it's another one of those things that only applies if your material reality is going along with the dialogue, you know, basically that they have approved. Um, you know, so for example, if I point to my material reality as a poor white trash person, you know, that's not going to be relevant to them, you know, because you know, that doesn't fit the narrative. Um, you know, but it also, you know, when they talk about material reality and, you know, just being able to flippantly say, I'm not going to listen to that argument. You have to remember that these are the same people that suggest that police shootings right now are an active genocide, despite the fact that only 259 people were killed by police in 2019 out of millions of police interactions. 
you know, and of course, you know, if you were to make that comment in one of these classrooms, I have a funny feeling that, you know, you'd be one of those people who's violating the student's um, code of conduct, even though you're quoting actual correct statistics. Now, again, as I said in my video about police shootings, all deaths matter. However, the material reality of, of nobody in the United States is genocide. Nobody is experiencing genocide in the United States, period. But if you're allowed to just kind of define your own material reality any way you want, and if only certain approved people are allowed to challenge it, even if you've said something completely irrational and illogical, what kind of learning environment are you creating at that point? Because people are just allowed to make propaganda into truth. Um, calling it out is another way. If the setting the tone doesn't work and it still seeps in, call it out. Keep an eye on topics, right? Be sure that you're doing check-ins and you help students out. This can be in 1113 when they do unit two. Um, so I, in this case, I usually look for my students who might be um, like entertaining the idea of listening to a problematic argument. Then I say, mm, we don't have to listen to that. Like that's not an argument that you have to listen to. And then in 1213, you want to check topics from the beginning to help them maybe like steer them towards something different if they're getting into some problematic territory. Uh-oh, somebody might even be entertaining the possibility of listening to a problematic argument. You know, we got to steer them away from that. Um, use reflection and rhetorical listening to move them into appropriate topics, right? So have them sit down with them and take the time to be like, so why is it that you want to take this argument? And what stake do you have in this argument? Why is this so important to you? Because a majority of the time when people are taking up an ism, right, an, art, uh, an argument with, uh, with racism or white supremacy at its base, if you have them sit and think about their stake as compared to others, it becomes really clear really fast that their stake is only, I want to argue and yell, right? It's they don't have a physical stake in it, like the people who they're arguing against. So that's helpful to, to use rhetorical listening and talk about stakes. Um, and then just use the curriculum and assignment goals. You can speak back to the curriculum all the time to help sway students. I don't know if you're going to have an effective paper, if this is what, what you're going to take up. Um, how are you going to convince someone who literally has to be afraid when they get pulled over that this isn't a big issue? Like, do you think that that's an argument that can be made? So you this, I don't know if you're going to have an effective paper is kind of like a teacher telling you, I don't think you're going to pass if you make that argument, you know, and then the point of, you know, well, you know, how are you going to convince somebody who has to be afraid because they're being pulled over is another example of the overinflated perception of how often people get killed by police. Um, I want everyone to know that you are not going to be reprimanded by FYC if you are doing things to address racism in the classroom. In fact, we want you to make sure that you have an anti-racist classroom and that every one of your students feels safe. So if you have a student who is verbalizing and, and articulating hate speech, you can ask them to leave. You should ask them to leave. They have created a hostile environment in the classroom and they are no longer civilly participating. So you can say, um, you need to leave. That is not part of class decorum. It's stated in the syllabus. Um, I don't think many people have problems with students being like hostily. Um, is that hostily? Can I say that? Did I just adverb something in the wrong way? Uh, but that are hostile about it. I think a lot of times it's when students are just kind of, it's rooted in a place of ignorance, not hate or violence. Um, but there are times that they do, um, and it's fine to ask them to leave. If they do it from a place of ignorance, but it's still very problematic, call it out right? Let them, let it be a reflection moment. Don't allow it to just go on or slip by because you're also setting a tone for all your other students in the classroom and you're demonstrating to them. You're, you're, all your students need to know that you're an ally and you will create a safe space for them and you won't allow language that's been damaging to them. So it is fine to um, call it out whether... So the issue of what is harm and what is safe um, you know, and what you're protecting them from is one that's kind of a point of contention that kind of deserves its own video. I actually discussed that a little bit with Paul Rossi. We didn't get a chance to talk about how the definition of what harm is keeps changing. Um, you know, but regardless, what this is about is that we need to be able to protect students from opposing opinions that we find problematic. What's problematic? Whatever we want it to be.
whether it be um, emailing them later, doing it in the moment, but making sure that that doesn't go on. You have to gauge on a case by case instance, right? What's most appropriate, but absolutely call it out. That that helps your student learn and grow because a lot of times they're not meaning to do it. They just don't know better. Um, and then no, if if these things, if you're worried about these things, that it's going to come up in your evals or that a student's going to complain to FYC, we know. We know when an eval isn't you being hyper-political, it was you um, being protective of all of your students and not allowing these things. So you do not need to worry about repercussions at any degree in, in the university. Um, if you are responding to a student who is um, using problematic language in the classroom. So don't ever like be afraid or don't feel like you can't address it in a number of ways that you feel appropriate anywhere from emailing the student or setting up a meeting to stopping it right there in the classroom or even asking a student to leave if they're creating a hostile uh, teaching or learning environment. So she's assuring the teachers and the faculty, don't worry, you won't get in trouble, you know, if you stifle any, any kind of speech that we don't find appropriate. Um, you know, and if there was actually like, you know, KKK members who were students at the college standing up and saying overtly racist things, you know, yeah, I, I could see why you would want them to stop, you know, but at the same time, you know, I keep coming back to this theme over and over again. I don't want to beat it like a dead horse, but what they define to be problematic speech is not, it's just not rational 90% of the time. I had a question when we were talking about uh, rights. Um, what, what like rights do we abide by? Like it's not uh, a right to, I'll just go with uh, pronouns, right? If a male to female transgender student prefers she and somebody wants to write an article or uh, an essay about um, whether that is a hate speech to call them he or not, but it's not a right in the constitution. It's not uh, a right in the UN or something, but people are arguing that it should be a right. What do we do with those where the debate is still out there on whether something is a right or not? Cue the awkward silence. Here it comes. Yeah, those, that's a, <laughs> no one wants to hop in with that. I think we've actually had, um, like a couple of things that have come up, um, especially because right now it's like pronouns are one also like um, transgender athletes. That's a big argument that seems to be kind of swallowing things up right now. Um, but I think that that's another one that if you want to have a student that seems to be kind of arguing that they should be able to just use the pronoun that they want and disregard what um, like a trans individual has uh, like the pronouns that they prefer, I would again sit down with the student and kind of talk about, right? Like, what is your stake in this? Um, why would you argue, like, how is someone's pronouns affecting you in a personal way, right? And then also, because that's not really a political, like, you can't vote on pronouns so much, right? So that's another way I would use kind of like leading them in a different direction to say, this is definitely a debatable topic, but like, what is your end goal here? Just to like be able to disregard people's pronoun preference. And so I would use kind of a discussion with the student to ask them like what your end goal is. Cause sometimes it is, it's like, they're just engaging with it to like, like it's fodder when it's not fodder for other people. It's their actual like identity, you know? So I would, I would sit again and have like a conversation and be kind with the student about it, but like help kind of lead them. I'm not so kind. Yeah, uh, Kelly, Kelly's like, nope. <laughs> no, like if they're writing to and, and their goal is like, oh, I should be able to use whatever pronouns I deem acceptable for this person, despite what, how they identify, then they are invalidating that person's humanity and their existence. And that's not acceptable. Um, so I flat out, I tell them that. I'm like that you're, this is what this is doing. You need to pick something else because that's, you're not doing that. So the student asks about something that is still in debate and the redheaded teacher basically, you know, kind of gives a, you know, more of a, I'm going to manipulate them out of having that position argument. 
And then the teacher with the glasses, you know, is like, well, I'm not so kind. Um, no, you're wrong. You can't do that. You can't say that. You know, um, you better pick something else, which basically just has the weight of or you're going to fail. So you have to embrace this non, you know, established reality that other, per you know, that other people have, you know, that is still in debate uh, because it suits the whims of that professor. You know, um, so that basically brings us to the end of the part of this video, parts of this video that I thought were extremely relevant, um, you know, but I, I want you to consider, you know, you may even have to rewatch this a couple times to get all the nuances of it, you know, that what we're looking at here is that this is a, you know, essentially a systemic attempt to, you know, deeply root their ideology into every aspect of education, to have a strategy involved with how to handle any kind of dissent, you know, in a kind of a draconian way, you know, of no, you're not allowed to have that opinion, you know, and if you try to have that opinion, then we're going to report you, you know, this is the circumstances in which we're supposed to be helping people to grow and, you know, to become their own people. And unfortunately, that's just not really, it, it's not their priority. Their priority is no, you know, we, we need these people here to indoctrinate them. And if you don't obey, then you're not going to pass, you know. So, you know, think pretty hard about this and look for these kinds of things as they crop up. Because, again, this video was not meant for public consumption. You know, I don't think any of them ever expected that um, people would have had this video outside of their university. And you'll see how, like, the people are blotted out, like they don't want their identity released because they were part of this. You know, that's another example of what I mean. So... Anyway, um, I have more work to do on this. I'm actually probably going to work next on this video of somebody reading a children's book that is part of um, CRT in schools at the elementary level. And I'll probably actually do that today because it's not a very long video. Thank you for tuning in. You know, please like and subscribe and share. Um, I'm definitely getting throttled. Like I noticed that I went from like three to 4,000 views and then I did the documentary about comparing the riots on January 6th to the riots of all summer. And then all of a sudden I started getting like 200 views. <laughs> so you guys are going to have to help me with the algorithm if you want to continue to have this kind of content. Thanks again.